really since 1969. We've done basic upkeep maintenance over the years, but it's really under, it needs to be maintained at a higher level and or renovated. And really, from our perspective, it needs to be renovated and expanded to truly meet the needs of the community. So we proposed a project that would expand the building, probably double the size of the building, and also potentially add another uh, facility, a, a gymnasium or something like that, a fitness center, that would serve both the youth and the adults and all the way through seniors in our community. So that's a project that we put on the, on the books. We're going to be moving forward with a grant application. Actually, tomorrow we're going to be submitting that. And uh, we'll introduce a couple of the other staff as the, as the night continues. But as that project moves forward and we're, again, applying for grant funds through the state, we're applying for up to $5 million. If we get that, we can really do quite a bit. If it's a lower number, we can still, <clears throat> excuse me, make some renovations to, <clears throat> excuse me, the existing building and then additionally over time add on to that building and, and give it some additional space. So we'd be able to provide activities for the entire community, a larger meeting space. This facility is fairly new and it's a nice meeting space for the community to hold family gatherings, um, have meetings like this, hold classes, etc. So this it would be a building like this, but even larger, they could help meet the needs of the community. We don't have many buildings that are this size and not in this type of uh, atmosphere where they're upgraded and renovated. So that's the fundamentals of the project that we're applying for. On the short term, we're gonna be making some improvements over the next few months. There's an old restroom facility that's gonna be uh, demolished and a new restroom, prefabricated restroom is gonna be installed in the next couple of months. So that'll be completed actually in the next three to four months. We're also upgrading the lighting throughout the park. We'll be updating some of the walkways, putting in a new basketball court. There's a basketball court that's really in the parking lot <coughs> essentially, so we'll be able to add some parking by moving the basketball court and then also adding a volleyball court. So that's a project that's moving forward in advance of this bigger picture expansion of the building project. So I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. I think that's in a nutshell. John Nix is our Deputy Director of Community Services and he's been working on that project for, for several months. And then this is Jeanette Ortega, our Neighborhood Services Coordinator. She's working on the grant application that will be going to the state to uh, acquire that funding because it's really tough, that's one of the challenges is to get the funding for those types of projects. We don't want to go into our general fund because we need that for our day-to-day -day operations. So we're often looking for grants, uh, partnerships with other, with other uh, nonprofit agencies, for example. For example, like Kringer Park, maybe we're looking to partner with the Boys and Girls Club, for example, and if we can come up with a partnership where maybe they come to the table with part of the funds, that may be able to take the project a little bit further. So those are things that we're always looking for when it comes to park building improvement projects. Thanks, Steve. Uh, stay standing, Steve, because I'm going to have you address some other issues. Uh, <laughs> I know you three are from Kowski Fullerton here on child development. Right. So maybe Steve or some of your member of your staff can talk about some of the services we offer the community in the area of child development. And then perhaps I can have our assistant uh, principal of Valadez, uh, is it Jeffrey Mays? Yes. Uh, come out and talk about what uh, he does over at uh, Valdez and we can potentially answer some questions that you may have regarding child development and that way you guys can feel like you've got some answers regarding that. So Steve, you want to do that? Yeah. Why don't I introduce Felipe Zambrano to come forward. Felipe Zambrano is our Community Services Coordinator. He's been with the city almost 20 years. Uh, started as a part-timer and was working at one of our community centers and continued to progress through the agency. Worked for the school district for a number of years and we stole him back from the school district and now he's with the city and he's done a great job as a full-time employee for the last 10 years. I'd like, uh, Felipe, if you would share some of our after-school programs and the programs that are taking place this summer here. Um, we also have some additional information from neighborhood services that we can talk to you a little bit about. Uh, real quickly, right next door to us is the Head Start program. That's not a city-operated program, but that's a youth development program for preschool-aged children. And if you like additional information on that, we can get that to you as well. But they utilize the building there that is actually owned by the Head Start and the school district collectively. We own the property of the building as well. But we'd like to talk to you directly about some of our city programs. I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> um, some of the uh, after school programs and summer programs that we offer here for the youth, um, we have three different sites. We have a site at the uh, Parque de los Niños. Gomez Community Center, which is over off of Orange Store and Van Buren. We have another site at Cook Park, which is located over off of uh, Valencia and Golden here at Tri-City Park. And then Wind Center here located here. 
Um, right now, our current summer hours are 11.30 to 3 p.m. And following the recreation portion of it at 3 o'clock, the pool opens. So the pool's open Monday through Thursdays from 3 to 4.30. So really from 11.30 to 4.30, there's plenty for the kids to do here um, and at uh, Gomez Center because they also have a pool. Cook Park does not have a pool, but their hours during summer are 1.30 to 4.30. Um, and there's recreation leaders like, like you see across the way. We, we thought we'd get some kids um, this evening so that we opened up, but there aren't any. But we have leaders certified in CPR. They're trained on different recreation skills, um, activities, crafts, active games outside. That's our big push right now is, is keeping kids active, uh, keeping them busy. Um, our, our, our belief over in the parks program is active kids stay out of trouble. Um, when kids are just sitting around and we're not engaging them, that's when they're, when they're causing trouble. So we try and be as active as possible, weather permitting, we're always outside as, as much as possible. Um, and if you didn't grab a flyer, these are on the back counter, it tells you the specifics, hours, and locations. Um, and we're not open just in the summertime, we do operate also during school year. During the school year, we're open not as many hours, we, it's right after school, um, it's from 3 to 5.30, uh, Monday through Thursdays. We do offer still the recreation portion of it, but we add some tutoring, some education assistance for kids who need help with their homework. Um, and that's at, at here at Witten and at Gomez. Um, in the fall, we'll be offering the program over, which is going to be new. We'll be offering the program site at, the, at Tynes Gym, um, and we'll be identical. We'll still have recreational activities plus tutoring help um, for any of the younger kids. Um, all our age, age ranges that we market to are ages 6 to 14. Um, and again, that's going to be a new site, so we're excited about starting that over at Times Gym, and that's located over off of Bass and Shuri and Tuffy Boulevard. So we have services spread out throughout the entire city. We're not focused on one end of town or the other. It's, it's kind of really everywhere, wherever there's a, we can find some, some, some space and the need. There's a big need over in that Tuffy uh, area. So we thought we'd try and give that a program. We also had, um, during this last school year, we had a program at our, our teen center, which is located over at Kramer Park, like we were talking about earlier. So we're just trying different things and see where, where the biggest, biggest need is. Any, any questions on any of our uh, parks programs? Yes? I don't have a question, but I just want to praise everybody. Um, what a good job you're doing to involve you know, yourself into the community. I live in Santa Ana, and they just built a brand new Y. And it makes all the kids feel, you know, so important and just so good, you know, to have these new facilities and take them out of trouble. No, you're right, and the kids, I mean, here, um, Veronica Cervantes is back there. She's our lead staff person here for Wind Center, um, and Brenda Cervantes works at our Cook Park, and they, they do an excellent job. Here at Wynn, um, we just opened this week, and we're averaging over 50 kids in the past, each day, in the past few days, and that's only going to grow. Um, last, sum last summer, we were pe peaking at over 60, like nearly 70 kids a day, so. Um, they do a really good job. It's a lot of work to keep all those kids active and not just laying around. So we, um, Park Students is a great team. Are these programs free? The programs are free. There is no charge. The only time there's ever a charge is if we do an excursion. All our activities, all our, anything that we offer is completely free. Here at Wynn, we also offer during um, summertime, we offer a free lunch. And actually, it's a free lunch to anybody under the age of 18 partnership through the Friendly Center nonprofit organization, through Second Harvest Food Bank, and through a Senior Service or anything? Through, through Senior Serve. And they're offer, we offer lunch at 12 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. Any, anybody under 18 can come get lunch. And during the school year, it's a snack after school, another healthy option snacks every day. Again, anybody under 18. Ms. Grace, you want to come up and talk a little bit about Valdez and maybe your student population? And that you serve so that these young ladies have a sense of that and I think there's a new a resident that just joined us so perhaps you may have some questions about uh, your role over there at Valdez. Okay well Valdez is looking just right over there. Um, this is our third year of existence. We just finished our third year of existence uh, so we're going into our fourth year of existence next year. Um, we serve sixth through seventh, I'm sorry, sixth through eighth grade uh, students and pretty much the majority of our students come from the La Jolla area and over by the Rio Vista area. So that's where our, all of our students are coming in from. Um, and we're doing some, some pretty amazing things. We have a, 
a partnership with um, a, a group called Goals, Disney Goals. They used to be Disney Goals, but no longer. But anyways, they come in every day after school, and they run a program after school for some of our kids. So they don't have to go home right away. They can stay in. They usually stay till about 6.15, 6 o'clock at night, on those on Monday through Friday. And with that, some of those kids get to join. They, they do all kinds of sports throughout the time that they're doing that. They get to go over to the Anaheim Ice and skate, so we actually have a hockey team that gets to do that. Um, but they have multiple, multiple activities, sports activities that the kids can do and stay involved with uh, recreation through that one as well. Um, so, any questions for me regarding the holidays? So it's a middle school that just opened? Yeah, we just, three years ago. We opened our doors three years ago. So, and Alrose isn't too much older. So we're like that. We could just school. I was going to say some quick history on that. Um, the school was previously right next door where Mel Melrose Elementary is, was a school until 1979. And then the city, because of lack of attendance, I think, um, Councilmember Underhill, ended up being sold to the city. So the city took it over, created a recreation center and a human services office at the, the, the site that is now Melrose Elementary School. Then in 2000, the district realized that they had enough children in the area to reopen a school. So they came back to the city and requested to purchase the land back, which they did, built the school, and that's when we moved. We were here, but then when we expanded these facilities to be able to incorporate all of our neighborhood services, human services, and all of our recreation activities. That's kind of a little bit of background on that, just to share. Any other questions regarding Melody? Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Appreciate your attendance. Uh, for our residents here, we have a couple more that have uh, come in since uh, we started. Uh, we're having a little bit of an abbreviated uh, neighbor conversation tonight because uh, we only have a few uh, residents in attendance. So uh, we're going to give a few presentations here. But if you have questions at any time on any issues, uh, feel free to ask. If you need uh, Spanish translation, just let one of us know. And we're happy to provide you Spanish translation. So you need it. OK, so uh, yeah. Leah, you're going to be my, yeah. my translator. So may, maybe just let her know that what we're doing. And, uh, okay. Do you want me to sit here? Yeah, maybe best, yeah. Okay. So, okay, yeah. sorry. So what you bring up to speed what we're doing and tell them, ask them if they have any questions thus far on any issues that they may have and we can answer that. Otherwise, I'm going to go on and I'll be slow so you can keep up with okay. me. Uh, translating where we are um, for the rest of you. Uh, last night, the City Council approved the City's 2011-2012 operating budget, uh, its capital improvement program budget, and its redevelopment agency budget. Uh, those documents are our guiding documents on how we're going to both receive revenues and spend revenues uh, throughout the fiscal year, uh, which starts July 1st and runs through June 30th. Uh, so. Uh, we're very pleased that uh, the council approved that and that we have our spending plan in place and there's a lot of projects that we have uh, scheduled to go forward and some of the projects that Steve just mentioned are included in that uh, capital improvement program and uh, some of the enhancements on our uh, electronic technologies uh, Jefferson are also included in that budget so you'll be pleased to know about that. We ready Leah? Okay. <laughs> Sure. And for your budget, do you guys have like a certain like higher level of priority village of like what you're going to spend like money on first? The, the question uh, she has is, does the city have a priority on how we spend our dollars? Uh, we do, and that's determined by the city council. The council had a goal setting workshop in January of this year. Uh, they determined that public safety was their number one priority, uh, followed by uh, public works, basically maintenance of our uh, infrastructure, so streets, uh, sewers, uh, flood control channels, uh, things that uh, we need to basically uh, exist as a, as a urban environment. So uh, public safety uh, does represent about 50 some percent of our budget. 
Uh, that includes both the police department and the fire department, uh, which is contracted through the Orange County Fire Authority. And then the remaining amount of the budget is then allocated to the other departments, public works, community services, uh, administration, uh, planning. So all the other things that we do as a city gets the balance of the budget. So we essentially have uh, about a $30 million a year budget and uh, we're bringing in just uh, over $29 million in revenue. So you can see we already have a little bit of an indifference in the amount of uh, revenues we're bringing in versus the amount of expenditures we have. But, uh, that's not uncommon these days because everybody is uh, suffering from the economy and even cities are finding it difficult to uh, provide coverage for all the services they provide. So in Santa Ana, as you know, they're having huge cutbacks. In the neighboring city of Costa Mesa, they're looking at significant layoffs. Uh, so these are just a sign of the times that we're in. Okay, we up to speed. Great. So a couple other things that uh, we'll talk about. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. Uh, for those of you who live in Placentia, some of the things that you probably will start seeing in the next few months are the construction of our grade crossings. Uh, as you know, we have a very large $590 million uh, capital improvement program called the OC Bridges Project. It consists of five bridges here in Placentia, two bridges in Fullerton, and essentially is going to take these grade crossings at the rail uh, line and put them either under the rail or over the rail. Uh, the ones that are gonna start up most immediately are Placentia Avenue and then at Kramer. Uh, Placentia Avenue is scheduled to start uh, in September. Uh, it will include a bypass road. I'm sorry, I'm probably going way too fast. Yeah, I'm just like. <laughs> you have to summarize. Uh, it will include a bypass road so you can drive up and down Placentia Avenue, uh, but traffic will still be very congested and uh, it will uh, there will be delays. And so, uh, as we get closer to the construction kickoff, uh, there will be signs up saying take detours and uh, just be careful for you traveling into Cal State Fullerton. You need to be aware of that because it is going to be very congested. When they do the Kramer project, uh, which should start within the same month or maybe a few weeks later, they're actually closing down Kramer. So Kramer will be shut down completely for 18 months. So you will not be able to travel north-south on Kramer uh, past uh, Crawler uh, north and then past uh, Chapman south uh, for 18 months. So just be aware of that. Uh, but these projects, once they're complete, and they'll be completed over a number of years, uh, 2016 is the uh, last uh, date of the last bridge project, and that will be um, Lakeview. Uh, these projects will provide uh, better access because they'll no longer have to wait, people will no longer have to wait at the uh, rail crossing for the train to pass because you'll be able to go over it or under it. So it will provide uh, much greater uh, speed and as well as uh, the ability to pass through these areas without having to be delayed by train. So it's a very great project for our city and all of all of Orange County, but you just have to be aware that for a very long period of time, six years, uh, we're gonna have some major construction activity and some of those uh, locations like Kramer uh, will be closed down for a, a lengthy period of time. So you just need to be aware of that. Yes? Will the 57 be affected by the traffic? Well, as you can see, the 57 is also being expanded at this time. So the combination of the expansion of the 57, the closure of Kramer, the construction at Placentia, and then State College and Raymond are also going to be under construction, is going to create some real difficult challenges for commuters here in North County. So all I can say is be patient, because once these bridges are done, uh, it will provide much greater uh, ability to travel, so it's just a, a, a inconvenience for a period of time to get a much better transportation system in the long run. Other questions on the OC Bridges project? Uh, there's information in the back if you want uh, the flyers on the project, we can tell you all about it, uh, so you can read it on your, on your own. Do you have any other questions on the parks that we need to answer? You've got all the answers there. I even found that I didn't realize the dolphins were in storage. You know the fountain yes. on the corner? Yes. Because over in Florida, where I live, um, they had stolen the uh, light standards in the post office and wound up finding them at an antique store in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled that you have your your dolphins in storage. 
We do. Yes. I've actually seen them. Let me, uh, do you have any questions back there? Um, she just wanted to know if the little um, sheds at Craver Park are to rent, or is it just on a first come, first serve basis? Oh, the picnic shelters? Steve, you want to address that? Yes, uh, they are for rent. Um, you can reserve them in advance. If no one rents them, and they're not rented in advance, for example, you're, they're first come, first serve. But you take a little bit of a risk, especially on the weekend, that someone may have reserved that spot, and if that happens, then you would have to, to move if they ended up being rented. So weekdays are usually pretty easy. If they call ahead or they contact our office, we can check and make sure that it's not already booked. Um, but you know the, the pricing, we can go over the pricing and so forth. It's not real expensive, but you can reserve it in advance. That's probably the safest way to do it. And it's reserved for you. If anybody else is, is sitting there or set up camp, then they would have to move. And not only at that location, but at the rest, the rest of our parks, we have uh, rental opportunities for the picnic shelter. Give her a few moments to translate so she can catch up with us. Yes, Connie. You know, I have one as mentioned at the shelters. I've noticed that at Tri City Park, a number of people probably in lieu of renting shelters take their own sunscreen, set those up, and have their parties within. They don't need any permit for that as long as they find available space. Right, as long as they're not encroaching on the rental areas and as long as their event doesn't get too large. If it's real large and we find out about it, it creates a problem for parking and for other activities that for people that did reserve it or if we have another function. But if they just have one of the easy up canopies and they want to go to an area that's open in the park. Just anywhere on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. We'll uh, continue to take any questions we have, but I'm going to have uh, our police chief, uh, Rick Hicks, who uh, just recently joined us, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the services his department offers. Uh, there's a neighborhood night out uh, that's coming up in August. August 2nd. And he'll talk a little bit about that, as well as uh, crime prevention, crime watch. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, what the police department does and the services it offers, this is your time to ask the police chief himself. So Rick. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, the essence of effective policing is the same today as it was 100 years ago and 100 years before that, and it's simply this, that the police and the community act as one, that we share information. When I share information, that means that it works both ways. We get information, we provide information, hence the meeting like what we're having this evening. And we also want to make sure that we, with the community, have a message of clear understanding that the police don't represent any one group. I represent all the people. I represent all the community of, of Placentia. And the uh, emphasis is on problems and on issues, and we want to work properly to solve those. So in order to accomplish that, some of the things that we have in place is uh, we have a community uh, watch person by the name of Maureen Becerra. And Maureen Becerra runs our neighborhood watch program. Neighborhood watch means that we try to uh, mobilize the community to give us information or to receive information that's meant to help keep you safe and secure and prevent crimes that take place in the community to what we call target harden your property that is put into effect safety things like door locks or window locks or fire alarm issues that would help protect your property or your business um, we can come out and have meetings like this where it's just the police and, the, uh, and our staff working on particular issues with you Speaking of which, I just happened to glance over and I want to make sure I introduce Ward Smith. Captain Smith, who will soon be Deputy Chief Smith, in fact, on July 1st. Ward has been with the police department for over 30 years. And if, if you want to know anything about the PD or the city, you talk to Ward. Um, but people like Ward are the essence of our law enforcement community. And they're the ones that come out and will meet with the community. Uh, Troy had mentioned our uh, National Night Out. National Night Out is a way for the entire community to come together and celebrate safety and security. And the way that we do that is up at, what's the name of the center that we have in Elms? Town Center. At the Town Center on August 2nd, we're going to have uh, opportunities for the community to come there and, and see some of our SWAT equipment, to have access to some of the specialized things that we do. Uh, we'll have uh, some business interests there. And it will be just a fun evening where we can celebrate the community and celebrate safety issues. 
furthermore, with Maureen, if you want to arrange something where we share information with you, or if you want to have a community or neighborhood watch kind of a meeting, she's available at the police department, and I want to give you the phone number so that you'll have it to be able to call. If you're ready to write it down or to hear it, I'll give it to you right now. It's 993-8225. And what she would then do is take your information, we'll set up a date and a time and a location to meet, we'll bring crime information, uh, we'll bring recommendations for how you can be more secure and safe. Uh, we'll come out and maybe if there's a problem going on in the neighborhood, we'll start the process of working with the community to fix that problem. So the essence of community policing and of effective policing is simply that we work in cooperation with the community to serve to serve one another. So is there any question about uh, the police department? Yes, Jeff. The uh, crimereports.com where they give live updates on incidents that happen, I notice they sometimes are kind of vague. Um, I'm not sure how specific are you guys allowed to disclose in terms, you know, due to privacy issues. Like, because it'll say like 500 block. So for example, there was one 500 block on um, next to Valencia High. Uh -huh. And so I was thinking, oh, that must have meant it was one of the houses on the 500 block, but it ended up being just a, um, a theft from a car that was parked at Valencia High School. But I had to contact um, Maureen uh, to yeah, Maureen. figure that out, but it took, you know, Yeah, there, there's of days. Different, different laws reporting things that regulate what we can or cannot disclose. For example, the age, uh, uh -huh. the sex, the type of victim that it is. So that information's not uh, uh, available to the press. We try to be very careful with particular addresses because we don't want to have someone have access for retaliation or some other kinds of purposes. Right. But if you have specific needs or questions, call Marine and we can get the information for you if it's something that we can disclose. But that's probably what you're encountering is a particular crime type or incident where we want to be a little cautious. Yeah, it's just the, the website, it, it'll list it as breaking and entering, but it really should have been maybe theft from vehicle or something like okay, that. Okay, something for Yeah, something, something to small. Anybody else? Well, this is uh, my seventh week on the job. It's been a great privilege and a, and a great start. I look forward to being with you for a long time. So if I can ever help, don't hesitate to call. Chief Smith has the same attitude about service. So thank you for uh, lending me your Thank you, Chief. As you know, this uh, Monday is uh, our Independence Day. We'll be celebrating the birth of our country. Hopefully you'll be doing that in a safe and sane manner. In the city of Sunshine, we have a zero tolerance for the use of fireworks. Uh, some cities in the county do sell fireworks legally, but here in Placentia, it is illegal to set off fireworks, regardless of whether or not they're safe and sane fireworks. And if you are caught, and the chief and myself will be on patrol on Monday so night. look out. Look out. Because <laughs> last time I went on patrol, we caught several violators, and we ended up issuing $1,000 citation. So please uh, be advised that if you're caught with fireworks on the 4th of July, or any other day for that matter here at the city of Pesetcha, uh, you will be issued a citation and you will be fined $1,000. Uh, last time that the former chief and myself went out, we actually caught the same guy twice. So he was issued two $1,000 citations. So it can become very, very expensive. Did he pay? Uh, he did, hmm. absolutely, he did. I'd like to have uh, our division chief from the Orange County Fire Authority with the city contracts for for fire services, Dan Drake, uh, speak a little bit about uh, the programs that they offer, uh, what to do uh, if you have fireworks that you want to get rid of, and anything else that Dan wants to talk about uh, regarding the fire authority. So with that, Dan. Well, <coughs> fire authority is here, and our main mission is to protect life and property. In the city of Placentia, we have two fire stations, one on Bradford and the other one on Valencia. We have a number of other stations that we have agreements with in the other cities that if needed, they would come over here. Um, we're in the process of reinstituting our um, smoke detector program. Uh, we're applied for a grant and we will have three smoke detectors in one of the areas we're gonna target is this area of Placentia, where we'll uh, partner up with community folks, nonprofits, we'll go out with them and install the smoke detectors. We found that in past, if we just delivered the smoke detectors, then somebody puts them in a drawer, and that's what he said. 
So we'll go out and actually install those also. So within the next three months, there should be information coming out about that. Uh, like Troy was talking about, the 4th of July is coming up and zero tolerance for fireworks. Uh, some of the programs we have, or one of the big ones, is if you find or have fireworks, illegal and or safe and sane, you can go to one of our fire stations and turn them in. No questions asked at all. We'll collect them, we'll store them in a safe place, and then we'll have our investigators partner up with the Sheriff's Department bomb squad and they'll dispose of them in a safe, safe manner. If you find fireworks laying in the street, don't pick them up. Call somebody else because it may not have been uh, ignited and they potentially could blow up in your fingers. If you're around people that are using fireworks, Basically, just stay away from them. You know, if you don't feel comfortable calling and reporting them, just stay away. Don't let them point them at you or throw them at you or anything like that. Okay? Questions? I have one. I, I, I believe the state passed the law that as of the 1st of July, homes are supposed to have a CO2 detector. Correct. The Will that be under your auspices? The specifics of that is, is within a residence, we can't enforce it, and we're not going to go out and inspect every private residence. And actually, our fire marshal is in the process of drafting up a letter that will go to all the city managers explaining that. But that is correct. We just will not enforce it. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, I'm going to probably direct this towards you because I think our residents here probably want to hear this regarding code enforcement and some of the issues in the La Jolla neighborhood, so I will have uh, Ken go as slow as he possibly can. Okay. So, actually, property maintenance is a huge issue in most cities. Uh, people who don't keep up their yards, people who sort debris or trash in their front yard or their side yard becomes a problem for all of us as a community because it affects the aesthetics of our community. Uh, Ken Domer, my assistant city administrator, oversees our development services departments. That includes code enforcement. Code enforcement is the arm of local government that goes out and enforces city codes. We're now retitling that division to call it code compliance. We believe that we're trying to get people to comply with our codes instead of having to go out and enforce. Uh, we want people to be compliant with our laws and our rules. And so one of the areas of our community, uh, La Jolla, uh, has a uh, property at 738 La Jolla. Uh, it's an apartment building that was under construction. Uh, it was never finished. And I'd like to have Mr. Domer talk about what's going on with that and uh, some of the other things that we're trying to do to help clean up uh, the community. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Gutzloff. Uh, as Troy mentioned, 738 La Jolla was a condominium complex that was started in development and never finished. So if you go down La Jolla Street, on the south side of the street, you see a ugly wood frame building that uh, has been declared a public nuisance by the city. Most recently in the last two months, the city was approached by a predator of the project. This person actually was an investor who lost his money but has title right to the property. So. We've been working with him to get his group to foreclose on the property, get ownership, and then that way they're immediately going to demolish the building and submit plans to the city. As recently as this past Monday, so two days ago, that group met with a title lawyer to start that process. So it has been two years or more of this ugly building sitting there but we're finally looking at a end to it and a hopeful quick demolition. So that's positive news. In a general sense on code enforcement, if you have any concerns about trash cans left out on the streets, um, weeded over lots, basically lots that have a lot of weeds. We've also, from the La Jolla area, have had complaints about 
commercial vehicles parked on the street and doing commercial activities, please give us a call. The code enforcement number is 993-8124. That'll take you in. We also have online the request partner system where you can file a complaint anonymously and we will respond. Um, code enforcement is reactive, so we do respond to complaints. But if we go out, for example, and the complaint was trash cans left out all week, and we notice five other properties have trash cans left out all week, all of them are going to get a letter. And the process is we try to be, you know, we try to seek compliance. We try to be friendly at first. We say, don't do it. We try to educate. If somebody continues to violate, then they get what is called a courtesy notice, which says, you're in violation, but we're going to give you three weeks to stop the practice. If they don't do anything with the courtesy notice, that's when the, the stick comes out and they get a $100 fine. Also a new timeline, if it's not corrected, the next fine is $200. If it's not corrected, the next fine is $500, and we can continue that each and every day if the violation exists. Usually at that point, we get compliance. So statistically, 75% of all courtesy notices get resolved. And then a larger percentage of that final 25% is resolved after the first $100 ticket. That's that wakes you up that you have to make a change. So it's been a very successful program. But again, code compliance is there is to help maintain your neighborhood. Make sure that graffiti is not there, trash is not there, trailers and boats are not parked on you know the front setback or the uh, public street. So, and we do work cooperatively with the police department. Um, so, if there's any concerns, the 993-8124 number or visit City Hall, go online, and we have a lot of public information on there. So is there any questions overall about code enforcement? All right. Do you have any questions? May I have a question? Okay, perfect, yes, how are we So thank you very much. What I'd like to do is uh, conclude uh, our neighborhood conversation tonight with a little discussion about some of the services that uh, we offer, not only as a city, but directly here through the Witten Center. And we have two individuals who spent a lot of time working here at the Witten Center and also working directly with the community who uh, are most knowledgeable about the various services that we offer. Uh, this ranges from not only the, the health services that we offer through other parties, uh, nonprofits who we've partnered up with, but a lot of the other uh, types of programs like the housing rehabilitation program. So I'd like to have both Leah and Roger come up here and uh, talk about the multitude of services uh, that we offer as a city, uh, directly through the Witten Center to the community. Uh, at the end of uh, our presentation tonight, if you didn't already notice, we have a number of uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs that you can take with you uh, as part of our efforts as, uh, as part as under the uh, federal, uh, federal Energy Efficiency Grant uh, that the city uh, received uh, as part of the federal stimulus program. We're trying to help make your homes a little bit more energy efficient, so please take one of those light bulbs with you. But let me have uh, both Leah and you, two light bulbs? Two or three, sure. Two or three, sure, you can take two or three. And an LED night light. And a night light too. Boy, we're giving things away today. Leah, Roger, why don't you go ahead and talk about some of the services we offer. Alrighty, um, so Sharpest Week, some of the programs that we offer here are the Housing Impact Program. So that is a grant that homeowners can apply towards. Um, and it's income based, so they have to submit different documents to make sure that they qualify for the funds. And that's all here, and I run that program, so if you have more questions, you can come to me. Um, then we have Community Action Partnership. And I'll translate afterwards. <laughs> Um, community Action Partnership comes on first and third Thursday of the month, and they provide utility assistance to um, basically residents of all of Orange County because we have people from Party Grove come, and they call their office, set up the appointment, and then they come here to our facilities and get help with like their light bulb, their gas bill, and I think that's it, right? Yes. 
Hoy tenemos dos programas, el que está ella encargada, que es para hacer arreglos a sus casas, que es una, como un dinero que da el Estado a ciertos arreglos que cubre y ciertos que no. Cualquier información que necesite, ella le puede contestar las preguntas. Uh, tenemos otra agencia que viene, que ellos ayudan a pagarle los biles. Supongamos que no tiene suficiente dinero para pagar el de electricidad o de gas, ellos ayudan y si califican, los pueden ayudar. Vienen el primer y tercer jueves de cada mes. So the health services are through St. Jude, so it's a mobile clinic that we have here at the Whitman Center on Mondays. And once again, whoever's interested, the resident has to call, schedule the appointment, and they're here from about 7.30, 7.30 to about 12. And then on Fridays at the Teen Center, same time, 7.30 to 12. And that's what we have for medical. And then we have a Cal Optima, which is a type of insurance. Um, she's here on Mondays and Thursdays for families that want to know how to apply for that program, um, what plans they should choose for their kids. So she's here, and then the Friendly Center sometimes helps too with like if they need to go see a doctor, they know a couple of you know doctors that have either a um, reduced cost or sliding scale fee. So that's for health. And then for food assistance, the second. Thursday of every month we have um, a food bank. So we get, again, commodities from Second Harvest Food Bank, like, you know, Felipe said. And we just make, you know, small bags, which don't go too far, but they go far enough. And then we have um, Community Action Partnership also comes with their programs, but which is geared for seniors 60 and over or women with children under the age of five that don't receive um, food stamps or quick. So they come and they get a food box, which is a lot bigger. So I think those are two, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, tenemos los servicios con la clínica móvil que se pone aquí. No sé si la han visto los lunes, uh, de 8 a 12. Y allá en Teen Center, allá por el Kramer Park, de la misma hora. Ellos ofrecen uh, cosas más simples como exámenes, uh, presión, uh, algunas vacunas. Pero con cualquier uh, uh, cosa que se le ofreza, Tenían, tienen que llamar para hacer una cita en adelante. Um, después tenemos la señora de Calóptima, si están interesados en aplicar para aseguranza medical, Healthy Families, tendrían que venir a verla. Ella viene el lunes y jueves de una y media a cuatro y media um, para poder uh, platicar con ella y ver qué, qué les conviene. Tenemos los pro, uh, programas de comida que es el segundo jueves que damos la dispensa que es una bolsa de latas, comida seca. Uh, solo viene, se apunta y le damos una bolsa. Uh, como le dije, el segundo jueves de 9 a 4 de la tarde. Y tenemos uh, el último miércoles del mes, es una caja de comida para personas mayores de 60 años o personas que tengan hijos menores de 5 uh, y que no están recibiendo WIC. Y luego, el último es el Senior Center, que es en Bradford. Um, It's open, I think it's the only place that's open on Fridays, right? It's Correct. For the city. So it's Monday through Friday, 9 to 1. Um, we do 55 and over. We have some people there, and people say seniors are about that age, but we do 55 and over. And we have um, daily, like, arts and crafts. Um, every Thursday they get some type of food program, whether it's the box or a bag or just any little thing. That's every single Thursday they have food there. And then we offer lunch through community seniorship. So that's a suggested donation. And I think that's it for the senior center. So any other questions you can ask me too. <laughs> sí. uh, y la última cosa que ofrecemos es servicios para la gente mayor, 55 años o mayor, pueden ir a comer lonche de lunes a viernes, uh, ofrecen actividades y clases, cosas así para ellos. Okay. Y la última cosa que ofrecemos es consejería con Friendly Center. Uh, y ella le, también la, los ayuda a referirse al algún lugar donde ustedes necesitan servicios. And just the last thing is, all these programs that we've offered, we've been able to develop partnerships with Cal Optima, with the Friendly Center, with Community Seniorship, because we haven't been able to do it as a city, but with them coming along to our side, you know, the Senior Center, going to the Teen Center, the residents have a couple more options as to where they can go for help with all the programs that we offer.
Okay. Any, okay. Uh, any other questions of any member of the staff on any issue or is there any comments you have uh, that you want us to be aware of or any concerns? This is your opportunity. Alguna pregunta, queja, que tengan? No? Oh, oh. Deputy Chief will get the information from you and we'll make sure that it's hauled up on so we can uh, cite them if they're not parked illegally. Other questions? You two okay? Very good. Uh, and since they came late, I want to make sure that uh, we introduce the two council members. So uh, okay. for their benefit, uh, go ahead and uh, introduce uh, council member. Oh, I know the morning. Okay. Yeah. Then you took care of that. Very good. I didn't know if you had. Right. Well, then Jeanette, why don't you come up? Um, I appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, it was a very small group, but I appreciate the, the three students from Cal State Fullerton on their participation. And I appreciate the uh, residents who were here uh, to help uh, better understand the services that we offer you as a community. And if you have other concerns or issues you want to bring up, staff will be available afterwards. You can talk to us directly. There's plenty of materials on the uh, tables back there if you want to take some materials back with you on some of the services, the OC Bridges project, uh, there's the light bulbs, uh, so please uh, feel free to pick those up. And for those of you who are in attendance tonight, uh, we are going to do a drawing for uh, two uh, $25 uh, gift certificates for the uh, Northgate Market off of Chapman, which is the brand new market there at Chapman and Placentia. Uh, so Thank we'll have... Everybody. Everybody fill out one of these who's, who's not a city employee. You, you didn't fill one out? Okay. Boss, you need to take the, the two chiefs put in. I didn't know if there was a Yeah, we're going to take yours out. So uh, Jefferson and uh, Nettie, if you'd want to go and fill one out. By contract. Did you fill one out? Okay. Keep your tax dollars in Placentia. We'd like you to shop, and if you shop, please come back here. I mean, you, it's not a very far run from Cal State Fullerton to go to Northgate and get yourself. And they got a very good uh, deli. It's really good stuff. So, and a vapor, too. So please uh, feel free to shop there. So we get everybody there? Oh, <laughs> If you want to come up, uh, we wanted to now. Yeah, we're going to have uh, Felipe come back up to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, concerts in the park, which starts this week, and then our movies in the park, which starts next month. And I'll let him talk about what's coming up and when they're scheduled. Okay, just a couple of things uh, that are really exciting to happen during the summertime, and I want to make sure everybody knows. Um, on, on Thursdays, beginning this Thursday, we have concerts in the park, and that's at Tri City Park. Uh, they begin at thurs uh, on Thursday. They begin at 6:30 p.m., 6:30 to 8 p.m. Um, there's food there for people to come and do a picnic. There, the bands play from six, the band plays from 6:30 to 8. It's a great atmosphere. Um, everybody's welcome, and it's, and it's completely free. And there's flyers on the back that tells you the schedule of the bands. For the, there's uh, for the rest of the summer. There's eight concerts beginning June 30th, every Thursday through August 18th. So please make sure to grab a flyer uh, on the back table. Also, Movies in the Park. Movies in the Park is also really um, fun, and that started several years ago, and that's held over at the Placentia Champion Sports Complex, which is over off of um, Rose and Alta Vista, and the actress is on here also. That's on Friday evenings, and that the movies begin 